praise the hallelujah in the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The key I raise a hallelujah with everything inside me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah Fear you lost your hold on me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King Alive. Sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder, oh, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder, my weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Oh, heaven comes to fight for me Sing a little louder In the presence of my enemies Sing a little louder Oh, louder than the unbelief Sing a little louder My weapon is a melody Sing a little louder Oh, heaven comes to fight for me Sing a little louder I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The King is alive I'm gonna sing In the middle of a storm A hallelujah. I'll raise a hallelujah. I'll raise a hallelujah. I'll raise a Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Olive Branch. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. Uh, Pastor Wayne is not here today. He just got back from vacation, so congratulations. You are all stuck with me. Um, so last week, we did finger guns to greet one another. Today, let's just do some air fives to each other to say hello. Some good social distancing air fives. There we go. If you smack someone in the face, you're probably too close. 
Um, but again, we're so glad that you are here today. Uh, we're going to continue worshiping together this morning. walk into the room everything changes darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring and when you walk into the room every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you It's 
10 o'clock Sunday school, it is back, so that's good. YC is coming back the first Wednesday of August from 7 to 8.30. Uh, there's a video on our Facebook page and my Facebook page and on YouTube that kind of gives a little bit, uh, probably too much information uh, as to what that's going to look like uh, next month and moving into the future. Um, kids ministry uh, or children's ministry for Wednesday nights, that's going to be starting up in the middle of September. And... Uh, Basically, there's a few more announcements in the bulletin, so go ahead and uh, read all of those because uh, there's just a lot to it. And I will say that I don't know if I can actually say it. I think I can. Um, parents, if you have a younger student who uh, basically it's either one kid comes to YC or both kids come to YC or none of them do, bring the younger one here. Uh, we'll put them to work or something, I guess, but uh, don't think that... Uh, we, we want you all to come. I like to think I'm not boring enough that I would bore a second or third grader. But anyway, that is a good segue into the children's sermon that we are talking about today. Uh, we are still going to be looking at Acts, and the person that we're going to kind of talk about uh, with this kid's sermon, hopefully Wayne does not use him next week or in the coming weeks, because like uh, our series today, he is also somebody that doesn't have a name. So uh, if he does preach this lesson in a couple of weeks, just act really surprised, act like you haven't heard it before. 
Um, but there's this moment in the book of Acts, and what I've learned in the book of Acts is that a lot of time is either spent in prison or on their way to prison. And so there's this moment in Acts where Paul and his friend Silas are in prison. And uh, they're doing something kind of strange for someone that's in prison. They are singing. They're singing hymns. They're, they're worshiping the Lord. And it's the middle of the night. And while they are singing, all the other prisoners that are there are hearing them worship, and they're, they're just learning more about Jesus. Now, we don't know. They probably were singing Waymaker. It doesn't say exactly what it was. But they're singing hymns. They're singing praise to the Lord. And so all of this has come out to say that there's this moment where there's an earthquake, and all the lights go out, and all the prison shackles and doors open, and the guy who's in charge of watching them starts to panic because he knows that if the prisoners are gone, his life will be exchanged for their lives. So if the prisoners aren't there, he's going to die. And so he gets very worried, but as, as you know, he's panicking, and in, in a moment he hears Paul's voice. And Paul says, hey, don't be afraid. We are all here. And so the, the prisoner, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the guard knows at that point there's something in this man's message that is worth noticing. So he goes up to Paul, he goes up to Silas, and he says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul just says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And so here's our two takeaways. One's pretty obvious. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Simple enough. And then number two, this one is also worth noting, that regardless of what you're going through, regardless of your circumstances, there is always a reason to praise the Lord, right? That's right. All right, so I'm going to pray for the rest of the service today. And then, uh, that's right, we don't have another song after this. I'm used to saying that we're going to keep worshiping, but I'll, uh, I'll pray. How about that? <laughs> Dear Lord, we're so thankful that you sent your son to die for us. I just pray that regardless of what we're going through today or, or any day, that we know that we can sing praises to your name. So we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name, amen. As you can uh, see, we're still continuing on our series uh, of the unnamed people in the Bible. I'm going to see if this clicker works because it did not work for me. First service, let's see. Did I do that or did you do that? <laughs> let's, oh, you did. All right, yeah, so once again, this is doing nothing for me. So Wayne gave it to me. I think he uh, gave it to me with a couple bugs on it, but... Anyway, so we're in Mark 5, 24 through 34 today, and this is one of my favorite examples of faith that is found in the Bible. The woman that we're looking at today is such a great example of, of looking for hope and finding faith in, in just unheard of circumstances. So we're looking at the woman. She, she's typically known as either the bleeding woman or the woman with the issue of blood, as some translations like to call her. And I will be completely honest with you, I cannot think of a more appropriate message in this time of global pandemics and social distancing than the message that we're going to be talking about today. David Platt, he's one of my favorite preachers in the world, and he actually preached on this, uh, this series of verses, I guess, uh, a couple of months ago. And this is what he said about it. He said, could God have us in a passage that is any more appropriate than this one on this day? When the world is deluged by a disease for which doctors have no cure, when leaders of every state and almost every country in the world have demanded social distancing from other people, when millions of people are losing their jobs and source of financial stability. So the main thing that we're going to look at this morning is that if we want to follow Jesus, we need to be desperate. If we really want to be a disciple of Jesus, we need to be utterly desperate for him because we cannot follow him if we are not first desperate for him. 
And so I don't mean that we are desperate for the things that Jesus can give you. I know, we know that Jesus gives us amazing things, but we can't be desperate for that. We need to be desperate for Christ himself. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, read verses 24 through 34. Here's how it starts. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she fell in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. So what is happening here? In this moment. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus heals uh, the man that had the legion of demons inside of him. So he is on his way. Well, he actually just gets back uh, to Galilee, and he, a man named Jairus finds him and begs him to come heal his daughter. It says that she is at the point of death, and he just is so desperate for Jesus to come and lay his hands on her so that she could be healed. So Jesus, his followers, and a great crowd, they uh, all start making this march over to Jairus' house, and uh, Basically, uh, they, they are going with the intention of seeing Jesus do something incredible. So from later on in these verses, we didn't read it today, but uh, we read that his daughter was 12 years old. And that age is kind of fascinating, but I'll tell you why in a couple minutes. So he, he goes there, and, and we hear of this woman who hears that Jesus is there, and she longs to find him. And so from what we read, we know that she had had this discharge of blood and that there was no... Uh, just no way for the doctors to help her. So, in fact, uh, what we actually read in, in some of these verses is that not only were the doctors not able to help her, she was actually getting worse because of the treatments that they were prescribing. So this was actually kind of typical of the first century because, you know, like if you uh, have a, a disease or something and you go to the doctor, sometimes you like to get a second or a third opinion, right? Well, in the first century, they would usually give their opinions but sometimes their treatment plans would completely contrast and contradict what the other person had already told them to do. So they would, would do one thing, and it would actually hurt them more because they were doing this, and it had a bad you know, reaction to this. And so this is not completely unheard of for the first century for people to go to doctors and get worse because of what they were telling them to do. So not only were they not able to help, but the Gospel of Luke even goes as far as to say that there was no cure for what she was going through. And it says that for 12 years, this woman had been dealing with this issue. So here's that 12 years that I had mentioned earlier that we were going to come back to. For 12 years, she had gradually gotten worse and worse and is at this point where she knows nothing can be done to help her. So look at it this way. For the amount of time that Jairus' daughter has been alive, this woman has been getting worse and worse with her physical ailments. So some of you have... Uh, kids that might be about 12 years old or grandkids that might be 12 years old or around that age. Imagine waking up every day for 12 years getting worse. Waking up maybe thinking today might be the day I start feeling better, but every single day is a reminder that you're getting worse and worse. So there's four problems that this condition has given to this woman. One of them is already up there. Uh, the first problem is that by the standards of the Jewish law, this woman is unclean. So due to the fact that she is, is physically unclean, by the law it says that she must be cut off from the people. This means that not only was she forbidden from being in town with the people, she was forbidden from marriage. Now the, the passage does not say if she was married or was engaged or, or had a husband and he died, uh, but basically she is just, she cannot be in a relationship or be near anyone else. So this goes right into the second problem of she is totally alone. Because who could be with her? No one by the standards of the law. If she's following the law, no one could be around her. For 12 years, her whole family couldn't even be with her. For 12 years, she's completely isolated from the rest of the world. Now, we know that we as human beings, we are not designed to live like that. 
We were meant to enjoy community with each other, right? Like one of the worst aspects of quarantine has been the fact that we have not been able to gather together, right? Like we're not able to, to see other people and interact in the way that, that God has given us to, to interact with one another. And so imagine for 12 years being completely isolated. You know, Laura and I went crazy after two months of quarantine and we had each other. So I don't know if that says a lot about me and her or if that says a lot about quarantine, but imagine just 12 years of not seeing anyone, of having no one. Now, not only did the law forbid her from marrying, the law also forbid her from worshiping at the temple or the synagogue. And so the church at this point in the first century was telling her that she could not come because of her physical condition. So she was alone physically, but she's also alone spiritually. That need for the body of Christ that we all have, even if we don't necessarily want to admit that we need the body of Christ, is alive and well with this woman. She longed to to be able to go back to the synagogue. She longed to be a part of the church. And we know that we need the church in our lives. So we have a totally alone, unclean, desperate woman. Now, we could stop right there and we would think that sounds really bad. That's where that's got to be the worst aspects of all of this. And we could stop there and it would be a, a tragic story, a tragic circumstance. But that's not where the misfortune stops. We know that the third issue, which is probably pretty obvious, is that she was in incredible pain. And so it was a pain that we know gradually got worse over 12 years. So it's nonstop pain. There weren't necessarily, to our knowledge, days where she was a little bit better, but she was getting worse and worse. So John MacArthur, he suggests that the source of her bleeding could have been a chronic uh, hemorrhage or it could have been some sort of tumor. Um, But... You know, whatever it is, she is in horrible physical agony. And then the fourth problem, which we may not have been as completely aware of, is that uh, she had spent all that she had. So not only was she physically worse off, she's financially worse off. Uh, Mark says here that she had spent all that she had, which we know likely was not that much to begin with, because she's either a widow or she's completely alone. It's not like her condition allowed her to uh, have a a job or make a salary or something like that. And so any kind of dollar that she may have had or old-timey dollar, I forget what they're called right now, uh, shekel, let's call it that. Uh, Any little thing that she gets, that's probably a pirate term, but anyway, anything that she got immediately would go towards a treatment that was not working. So every dollar or cent that she brought in, she's thinking maybe this is the dollar, maybe this is the amount that I need to get better. But every single time she gave a doctor or multiple doctors that money, nothing got better. Things got worse. Every cent went towards finding a treatment for an ailment that did not exist. So at the end of it, all she had were greater problems and greater disappointment. So this woman, she clearly sees Jesus as being her only hope. She knows that if anyone is going to help her, it's going to be Jesus. In these verses, we see her going through the crowd, which is a new experience for her. Because remember, she's not supposed to be in crowds. She's supposed to be completely isolated. Before she touches the hem of his garment, she's telling herself, if I only touch his clothes, I will be healed. And the way that we read the passage, the way that Mark kind of makes it sound, uh, makes it sound like she's almost kind of like walking through the crowd, just repeating this to herself. Of If I can just touch him, I'll be healed. If I can just do this, I'll be healed. Like she has her eye set on this one thing. So she does something, as, like when she finds Jesus, she does something that is radically unheard of in first century Palestine. The unclean woman touches the totally pure and clean Son of God. So the fact that this unclean woman would touch anyone was just unheard of. But something strange happens with this exchange. The law says that if anything that, anything that is unclean that touches something that is clean, the clean thing becomes unclean. This would even be like parts of the house or something in the, uh, in the law. So if you are unclean and you touch a clean person, the clean person doesn't become clean. He doesn't keep being clean. He stays unclean. But that is not what happens here. Instead of her uncleanliness being transferred to him, it's his cleanliness that gets transferred to her. So Mark tells us that this healing, it wasn't gradual. It didn't take 12 years for her to to make up the 12 years of pain that she had. We hear that it is instantaneous. And this is a beautiful image of the justification that we receive from the Lord. God does not gradually save you the moment that you come to faith in him. We know that it is instantaneous when we come to faith in him. 
He saves you for all time in the moment. So this woman realizes that Jesus was the only hope that she had. So for us today, that has not changed. That same only hope that she had is the same only hope that we have today. You see, what this woman found was the answer to the questions that, that mankind has really been asking uh, for, for since time began. What she's really wanting to know, and we might ask it in different ways, but it's pretty much it's the same question. She's asking, uh, where does the ultimate healing come from? Where does hope come come from? Where does my joy, where does my fulfillment come from? Now, deep down, if you look inside yourself, haven't we as mankind, haven't we been asking that question from the dawn of time? We've always been searching for something. C.S. Lewis kind of put it like this. Uh, I don't know the exact, I don't remember the exact quote, but he says that if we find ourselves looking for something in this world that this world doesn't have an answer to, it just means we're made for something of another world. And so, this is exactly what that, this woman wanted. She wanted to know where love, hope, fulfillment, joy, peace came from. Because here's the thing. She never experienced love, and she wanted it. She was running out of hope. She was joyless. She had no peace about her. Her problems at a much deeper level are ultimately the problems we all face because we're still asking the same question. Now, one of the things that I loved growing up, and I still love them even now, is that I love the Muppets. Any Muppet fans in here so I don't feel like I'm alone? There we go. I got my, my Kermit the Frog socks on today, actually. So y'all are welcome for that. Uh, but I, I love the Muppets. I, I got Benji kind of hooked on the Muppets not too long ago. I don't know if he still likes it, but at least I get to watch them. And uh, anyway, there's this old song from the original Muppets movie in the 1970s that you might remember. It's by the great theologian Kermit the Frog. And he asked this question, and you probably know what it is. He asks, why are there so many songs about rainbows and what's on the other side? And so it's, he's not just, Kermit's not just asking a numbers question. He's not wondering why are there physically so many songs that mention rainbows and getting over the other side of the rainbow. Uh, but what he wants to know, which is a kid's movie, but he's asking this deep question. He wants to know, what is all of this about? What is it about rainbows that alludes to that, that you know, finding fulfillment? What is it about it that, that you know, is just, just trying to see where our, our deepest joy and longings come together? He wants to know how desires and longings are being fulfilled. So for generations, mankind has looked for that rainbow connection to see what life is all about. Kermit wanted answers just like we want answers. He's a smart little frog, ain't he? So he wants to know where his fulfillment is going to be found, and unlike some because some people here think, some people have lost all hope that they're going to find it. Kermit here, he is still hopeful because he's, remember, he's saying someday we'll find it, the rainbow connection, the lovers, the dreamers, and me. So what is the rainbow connection? For us, what is the thing that, that, that brings it all together? And we know that it's Jesus Christ. He's more than just the rainbow connection. Jesus is what connects it all together. It's, he is ultimately where our longing and fulfillment meet and find their purpose. So, Jonathan Edwards, he once said that he who has a divine love in him has a wellspring of true happiness that he carries about in his own breast, a fountain of sweetness, a spring of the water of life. There is a pleasant calmness and serenity and brightness in the soul that accompanies the exercises of this holy affection. Like, doesn't that sound good for us as Christians? To have such a joy inside of us that it's compared to, like, if you had this this fountain of joy and happiness just living inside of you constantly. That is what we have to look for as Christians. That is our fulfillment. That is our joy. We don't have to long for other things because those longings are fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus. So the gospel, it is ultimately it is the only hope that we can latch onto. For this woman, Jesus truly was the only hope that she had. So where do we come into, or where do we come in at in this story? How can we see ourselves in the lives of this woman? And it comes down basically to this one question. It's a pretty simple question. The question is this. What is the gospel? What does it, the gospel mean? And at the very, the most simple answer that I can give you is that it is good news. And it is very good news. But here's the thing. Here's what we can see from this story. The gospel is only good news for a desperate and terrified man. It is only good news for a needy and desperate individual. 
I heard one pastor, he talked about it like this. What is the most terrifying thing that I can tell you? What is the scariest truth that you can know? And he put it like this. He said, this is the scariest thing you can know. God is good. In his congregation in that moment, he started, they started saying, well, hey, what's wrong with that? Like, That's the problem. That sounds like a good problem to have. And so he said, here's the problem. The problem with that is you're not good, you're bad. Not a single person on this planet qualifies as good. So what does a good and righteous God do with someone that is not good? Well, we are so unclean that we are led outside the camp of God's good fortune. God is good, and that should terrify us. So... Imagine it kind of like this. Imagine that you are a, 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 a horrible criminal, and you've been caught, and you're about to go before the judge, uh, if, but you, you hear this little thing of good news. You hear that the judge is corrupt. And in that moment, wouldn't that, that criminal be filled with joy to hear that the judge isn't good, that the judge is corrupt, that he can be bought? But here's the thing. Tell that very same criminal that the judge he's about to stand before isn't corrupt, he's good. In fact, he's perfect. He can't be bought, he can't be swayed, you can't, he doesn't buy into the lies. That should worry him. We stand before a good and righteous judge, and on our own, we just don't have a case. So the problem with so much preaching today is that people are telling you that deep down you are good. They're telling you that the problem that we have with sin is outside of you. That, that, you know, you might be good, you just have a couple of little hiccups here and there, but for the most part, mankind is good. But that is not what the Bible teaches us. So here's the thing. We are not good, God is, and that should terrify us. And it blows my mind that things like the prosperity gospel exist. Something that just does not fit in to anything that the Bible teaches, and it's being packaged as evangelical Christianity. I, there's a, a really great documentary on Netflix called The American Gospel, and it, it talks about all these false teachings that have been kind of brought into the church today. And I had to like watch it in spurts, because I would just get so upset, not so much that, that people were buying into this, but that, that so many people were just so deceived by this, that so many people go into the prosperity gospel thinking this is where my answers are going to be found. And they're, they're truly looking for the truth, but they're not finding it. Because the prosperity gospel is not focusing on anything but ourselves. So here's the thing. If you want to go and live your best life now, go and do it, but see what it gets you. It's not going to be good. Apart from Jesus, living your best life now gets you the same ticket to hell it gives to anyone else. And the fact that so many people are equating the American dream with Christianity in the mindset that you should only look to benefit yourself is insane. Especially when you consider the fact that Christ says that if we're to follow him, we're to deny ourselves. We need to totally deny ourselves. Now, should we not be concerned that the very things that the prosperity gospel is offering to us are the very same things that Satan offers to anyone that follows him? Wealth, health, Satan offers all of that. So I'm getting ahead of myself. This is like a second sermon that I could be preaching, but I ain't going to do that today. Save that for next time. God is good and we are not. So how bad are we? Well, Paul Washer, he put it like this. If you reject Christ, then the moment that you take your first step through the gates of hell, the only thing you will hear is all of creation standing to its feet and applauding and praising God because he has rid the earth of you. So how can we stand before a just and righteous God? And we know, hopefully, that it is only through his son, Jesus Christ. In this story that we have read today, and I always hesitate to say story, because when I think story, I think of things that didn't really happen. In this true historical event, what we see is a picture of what Christ does for us when we place our faith in him. This woman exchanges her impurities and receives cleanliness. In theology, this idea is known as the great exchange. And this is where our, our sins are exchanged for Christ and his perfect righteousness is given to us. Our sin is punished fully through the death of Christ and his perfect righteousness is given to us through his perfect life. So here's the thing. Unless we are truly desperate, our pride is not going to let us go to Jesus. This woman has given up everything in her life in the hopes of finding healing. And she does what many would think of as absolutely unthinkable 
and goes for the ch- just a chance of coming into contact with Jesus. So have we done that with our lives? Have we said, regardless of what it might cost me, regardless of what the world or family or friends or loved ones are going to think, I got to get to Jesus. I got to stand in his presence. I got to just touch his garment because that's all it takes is one small touch of faith and we're healed. So have we reached out? This woman did not hesitate to touch the Son of God. I like to think that sometimes we overthink coming to Jesus, right? Like, like we get worried at the thought of just how badly we need him. And we think that we are so bad and so dirty that we couldn't possibly stand in his presence. And we think that we have to just come up behind him and just barely graze him because we're so, like, like who are we to stand before him? This woman probably had these same exact thoughts. She felt that she couldn't stand before Christ and ask him to heal her because, I mean, we see that. That's why he, she didn't just come up straight to his face and say, hey, here's my problems, here's what's going on. I know you can help. Instead, she, she does it in, in hiding. So imagine the shock she must have felt when the eternal Son of God stops in his tracks and says, who touched my garments? She must have been terrified. And we learn in one of the other Gospels that Peter's the one that says, Lord, you see all these people. They all want to see you, and yet you're asking, who is it that touched you? And what he's saying basically is, Lord, that's a really silly question for you to ask. Look around you. There's a lot of people here. They weren't social distancing. And uh, how, how are you to know who it is that touched you? There's no way, really. And so finally, we read that this woman, she came in fear and trembling and fell down before him. She was so afraid of getting caught. She was so afraid of the truth being made known about her. So what was going to happen to her? Certainly because she was unclean and purposely made someone else unclean, some sort of punishment would have been in order. At the very least, she would have just been cast back into isolation again. But when Jesus asks who it was that touched him, I'm not thinking that he's asking in a condemning manner. He's not asking to condemn her. Jesus is obviously the all-knowing Son of God, so he knows exactly who it was that touched him. So here's what I think of. I think of Genesis 3. I think of that moment in the garden after uh, Adam and Eve had sinned, where they are in hiding. And what does the Lord do? He, He comes down and he says, Adam, where are you? Now, God knows exactly where they're at, right? He knows all. He knew what was about to happen. He knows exactly what, you know, the physical location of where they're at. But God is not asking out of ignorance. He's asking so that Adam might come to him. That's what Jesus is doing here to this woman. He's not calling her out to condemn her. He is calling her out so that she would come to him. In John Calvin, he wrote, God deals kindly and gently with his people, accepts their faith, though imperfect and weak, and does not lay to their charge the faults and imperfections with which it is connected. I'll be honest, I'm very glad to know that in Genesis 3, the very first thing out of the Lord's mouth is not, you idiots, you screwed it up, didn't you? Like, I'm really glad that's not the first thing that he says. The first thing the Lord says is, child, come to me. And so when Benji falls and hurts himself, the first thing I say is not, yeah, you should have known better, get over it. Rub some dirt on it, as they say. But no, when Benji falls and hurts himself, naturally what I do is I tell him to come here, I pick him up, I hold him, and, and this is what Jesus does to us, right? He calls us out to him. Regardless of how unclean and sinful you are, he's saying, I am not here to condemn you. I'm here to save you. I'm here to bring you to me. That condemnation that you are feeling, I have already taken on myself. I am here to take you into my arms. I am here to make you clean. And you see, there is a reason why Jesus called out this woman It was so that all would see her faith and see her as an example to follow. John Piper, he put it like this. He said, what Jesus was exposing in that moment was not her weakness and shame. What he was exposing was her faith. He wanted her faith visible so that everyone who carries a secret shame, which is every one of us, might have hope. So there's these these two interlocking moments in Mark 5, right? Going to heal Jairus' daughter and this moment with uh, the woman with the issue of blood. In both moments, they are a testimony to faith in what faith can do. Later on, when Jesus gets to heal Jairus' daughter, he simply tells them, do not fear, only believe. And then when this woman, uh, when when she came to Jesus and tells him all that she did, he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now, I really like how it's phrased in Matthew, because Matthew puts it a little bit differently. In Matthew, Jesus says, take heart, 
Your faith has made you well. What he's basically saying is, hey, be brave. Take courage. You know, admit to the things that you have done here. Stand out for the things that you've done. Take courage. Look, let your faith be an example to everyone around you. Now, here's the thing. Those that look for Jesus, any single, any person in this room that looks for Jesus is going to find him. It is never the amount of faith that one has that saves them, but it is always the one that the faith is in that saves. And if we look at this woman, she had nothing but faith. She couldn't have anything else. She had no money. She had no hope. She had nothing. She believed that Jesus would make her well, and he did not disappoint. He did more than just cure her of a physical disease. He cured her of her spiritual disease. And the sickness of sin is way more fatal than anything else. We know that sin has a 100% fatality rate. The greatest problem that mankind faces today is that sin without a Savior equals total separation. Not just separation from a crowd or from the church, but separation from God forever. So you see, without, without a Savior, we are just like this woman, aren't we? We're alone. We're, we're, we're without hope. We're sick. We're gradually getting worse. And yet... We know that we need a Savior. We need to be healed of our spiritual disease. All it takes is faith in the Son of God to cleanse you from every iniquity, and it's in that that we have a living hope. In Jesus Christ, we have a hope that cannot be taken away, that can't be crushed, that, can't, that, that doesn't simmer out. In Christ, we have a hope that is imperishable. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, 3, that according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Where did the woman in Mark 5 put her hope? It wasn't in the doctors anymore. They already said they couldn't help. She didn't have any riches. She spent it all on treatment. She didn't have it in community because she was alone. So where was it? It's in the one phrase that she keeps repeating, if I touch his garment, I will be made well. Not I might be made well, not I could be made well. No, I will be made well. Her hope was solely in Jesus Christ. So what is our hope in? What are we, where do we find the strength to be made well? Let me, let me tell you a problem real quick that the world faces and we might be even facing right now. If all of your hope is in yourself, if all of your hope is in your treasures, in your stuff, in your relationships, in the hope for a relationship or, or family or friends, I promise you one day that's going to fade away. It's going to die. And we know this because one day you will die and your treasures won't have any more use for you and you won't have any use for them. A loved one might pass away, and the fulfillment you looked for in them is going to be gone. Everyone that follows Joel Osteen or any prosperity preacher, here's the thing, they either never get what they want, or they're part of the very small 1% that does get it, but then they die and it's gone. If your hope is only in this world, it will die. If it hasn't died already, it will. The thing about authentic biblical Christianity is that it requires you to be realistic about the world that you live in. Are you tracking with me? If we want to really believe what the Bible says, if we want to live as Jesus has called us to live, we need to be aware of what is going on in the world around us. Christianity makes us stop where we are at, and it makes us realize that bad things happen, that sin is real, that suffering exists, and and really that outside of Christ, we're always searching but never finding fulfillment in the world that we are in. So Francis Schaeffer, he wrote this. He said, Christianity refuses to say that you can be hopeful for the future if you are basing your hope on evidence of change for the better of mankind. So the treasure and rewards of Christianity is not based on the here and now. We as Christians are not those that have their hope placed in something that is perishable. Our hope is in the one that is imperishable. So not only does the one that we hope in never die, he guarantees to us that we will live forever with him. If you want to have faith to be made well, put your faith in the one that is sovereign over every aspect of creation. Now here's the thing. For this woman, she was not just made better. She wasn't just made clean. She was made whole. She was made complete. Without Christ, you are broken. You are incomplete. You are guilty before a holy God, always searching for that rainbow connection, but never finding it. And Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Forgiveness is for the guilty. Do not attempt to touch yourself up and make yourself something other than you really are. Become as you are to him who justifies the ungodly. 
Couldn't the woman have, have gone up to Jesus and acted like she had it all together? She's not prettying herself up. She's going to him, and she is saying, this is who I am. This is what I got. I am unworthy. I am unclean. And yet here's the thing. Jesus is saying to her, you're the exact type of person I'm looking for. That's the person that I want. He, she is the very person that, that he came to save. Now, Satan's going to do all that, you, all that he can do to make sure that you feel the full weight of the shame that, that you feel like you have. He's going to do all that he can to point out the sins in your life and is going to say, how could a pure and righteous and holy God possibly love or want somebody like you? You have done nothing to earn any sort of standing to this righteous God. How is he going to accept you? And to that we say, you know what, Satan, I am exactly that. But fortunately for me, I know the judge, and I know that my debt has been paid in full. I've exchanged the impurities of my life for the very righteousness of the Son of God. And so... I love this quote by Martin Luther. And uh, basically there's this moment in Martin Luther's life where he had a friend who was going through this really dark battle with spiritual warfare. And he just felt that, that Satan was just bringing up these same accusations of saying, you know, who are you to stand before God? Who are you to, to uh, possibly think you have any hope for eternal life? So this is what Luther wrote to him. He said, so when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this. I admit that I deserve death and hell, but what of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is, there I shall be also. If you want to be made whole, it starts and ends with Jesus Christ. That shame that you might be feeling right now does not have the final word for all that belong to Jesus. And for some of us, we're so close to touching his garments. We're so close. All it takes is one small act of faith to cleanse us for eternity. And you see, for this woman, there's a pretty big difference between healing and being made whole. Because if all she was was healed, the physical problem may have been made better, but it would not fix any of the other issues that we talked about earlier. Yes, she may have been physically clean, but that does not fix the spiritual pain and the spiritual hurt. She could have been healed, but still alone, healed and yet still broken. But Jesus Christ, he took this desperate, unnamed woman and made her whole. Now this woman belongs to a community. Now she has a family. Now she has treasures and riches in heaven. She has an identity as a faithful servant of the Lord. She is complete. And I think it's so ironic that this, this woman who had spent everything for hope find it in something that he freely gives. He, she had spent all that she had, and Jesus offers himself completely free of charge for her. He freely gave himself for you and has freely offered himself so that your payment that you owed would be wiped in full. Now, the only way that we can truly embrace this is if we are desperate. He's of no use to us if we are not desperate. So my prayer is that not only I or, or, or my family, but everybody in here would throw themselves down at the foot of the cross and declare to the Lord just how desperate we are for him. Because we live in a world that is desperate for the gospel. The gospel we know is good news, but it is only good news for someone that is truly desperate. I'm going to pray together. I'm just going to pray that, that we embrace the idea of being desperate. That we put aside everything that's holding us back in the hopes that, that Jesus would, would be the one thing in our lives that, that just brings us to life, that gives us joy, that, like that, that well of joy that Jonathan Edwards spoke about. Let's pray together, and then we're going to sing. Dear Lord, I just pray that we are desperate people. We are desperate people in need of a Savior, and we know that you have offered yourself for us. So we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you for that. I just pray that everyone here today does not leave without remind, being reminded of just how badly they need you in their lives. So we love you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
talk about how that was going to end. <laughs> That's the run up here. Um, I, let me uh, pray for you all, and then we will head out uh, into the world, I guess. So let's pray together. One quick reminder, um, we do have the offering box in the back there. I didn't mention that in the first service, so hopefully nobody extraordinarily wealthy was here and doesn't come back. But uh, we appreciate um, the tithes and the offerings that you have been giving us over the course of you know, this really strange time of you know, financial uncertainty. Um, but let me pray for us, and then we'll head out. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that we can gather in your house and, and worship your name. We are so uh, glad to be called your children. So we love you, and we praise you, and we just pray that you bring us back safely next week. And in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Promise keep a light in the darkness. My God, 
That is who you are You are Waymaker, miracle worker Promise keeper, light in the darkness My God, that is who you are